Welcome back to the council. Uh, we are going to begin our afternoon session with a proclamation recognizing uh, the esteemed Jeff Zions for his years of service to the residents of Montgomery County. The list of titles too long for me to list right now, um, but I will be joined, uh, it will be presented by me and joined by Vice President Friedson and Mr. Zions, we welcome you to come on down. Good afternoon. I am so excited to be here to celebrate our friend and colleague, Jeff Science, on five decades of service. This is a gentleman who wears and has worn many hats working in the county. And I mean that literally because he literally puts on different hats uh, to describe different functions of the government power when it comes to land use. Uh, but he has been a fixture in Montgomery County government in land use and has done it with grace, has done it with intellect, has done it with class, uh, has done it with a sense of humor that's even funny sometimes, sometimes, um, and has brought a uh, unique personality to everything that he does, in particular the, the famous footnotes as we've come uh, to, to know them and now at this point to miss them. Uh, we're embedded in each staff packet on each policy issue is not only a nuanced understanding of land use policy, uh, but also a joke, uh, some type of uh, sarcasm that's carefully uh, included. And sometimes what we uh, work on here gets a little dry, so bringing a little humor uh, to that is important. But uh, wanted to note as well, uh, Jeff was ready to retire and to work on his golf game, and we certainly know that it needs that. And um, we needed him. The county at a time of need where the Park and Planning Commission needed a leader, needed somebody who was trusted and admired uh, both for his mind and for his heart, uh, and who had the best interests of the county always at heart and who understood uh, and had a deep association and relationship with the hardworking staff. Uh, we knew the person we needed to turn to in that time and moment of need and when the county needed him, when the council needed someone to turn to, when the Park and Planning Commission needed the right leader at the right time, it was obvious who that would be and it was Jeff Science. And so I, I am so grateful to him on a personal level having served here and now chairing the Committee of Jurisdiction over Park and Planning over land use issues. And I know all of us here at the County Council are just so grateful for Jeff for all of his five decades of service and particularly uh, for this uh, last year and these last several months, his willingness to step up uh, to serve the county he has served so admirably for so many years. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, our council president and then we have a proclamation to read. Uh, this is a wonderful afternoon and you know, Jeff might be Montgomery County's equivalent to Forrest Gump, always being at the right time in the right place. Right, And I say that as a term of endearment because every time we've needed you, you've been there. And even when you were unwilling to do so, you've stepped up. He was a better jogger. He was a better jogger. He's still running. And so the reality is um, the residents of Montgomery County um, owe you a lot. They owe your wife a lot, too. Um, and I know that you've always given it your your best uh, you have given it your uh, with all of your intellect um, and as has been noted with some of your humor as well uh, but while you might not be at the council clearly your sense of humor lives on in council vice president Friedson uh, um, but but we we really just appreciate you and I know that uh, as you begin this new chapter in your life. Uh, I hope you don't tune in too often to the council. I hope you don't read the packets too closely. Um, but the work that you've been doing for decades are still here. It's still in the packets. It's in the law. It's in the regulation. Um, and your legacy really does live on. Um, and it will, be keep, it will keep running. And so thank you, Jeff, for everything that you've been doing.
So we're, we're going to call up uh, Jeff Science and say a few words now. I'm just, I was deciding on my Forrest Gump line that I was going to use. I'm definitely not going to use stupid as a stupid does. Uh, but uh, your footnotes are like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Jeff Science. Sure. Thank you so much for this. It's quite the honor, but I'm still short. Um, uh, I don't know what to say. It's a terrific honor. <laughs> and I'm proud of the county, proud of its institutions, proud that I helped. And uh, I, I just gained some wisdom that uh, uh, the, the problems of today are yesterday's solutions. And with that, you have to have some humility for what you're going forward with. And, and it took me a while to learn that, but I, but I think I did. And I think the council is learning that too. Uh, but this is, has been a wonderful place to work. The people ha are terrific. Uh, there's nothing better than the staff at the council, I have to say. Uh, second is park and planning staff. You know, you have to <laughs> have to say that too. And it was a, an amazing adventure to be associated both with the people I had worked with before 2006, the people I worked with at the council 2006 to 2020, and then the new people at the planning board who about 15% of them are the same, but they were all there willing to help, trying to do their best, and it's a wonderful place to work too. So I thank you for this. Uh, it's beyond the pale, and I really do appreciate it. Okay, Council President and I are gonna read a proclamation from the County Council of Montgomery County. Whereas throughout his celebrated 50 year career, Mr. Jeffrey Zients has served Montgomery County as a leading expert in regional planning and land use issues, first in the Montgomery County Planning Department and later in the Montgomery County Council and. Whereas Mr. Zients began his career as a summer intern in the Montgomery County Planning Department and worked up to a position as division chief where he oversaw the work of and supervised 55 planning specialists in areas such as transportation, environment, historic preservation, park planning, and park resources. And whereas Mr. Zients joined the Montgomery County Council as a zoning and land use law expert for 15 years, leaving retirement to become a senior fellow and share his research and legal expertise with colleagues during a time of great transition and Whereas in 2016, Mr. Zions gained international recognition when he was spotlighted by the Washington Post local government and politics reporter Bill Turk in his piece, quote, this Maryland zoning attorney's footnotes come with a kick. And <laughs> whereas during his time working for the council, Mr. Zions wrote over 100 zoning text amendments and was instrumental in the huge undertaking of rewriting the 2014 zoning ordinance, a 1,400-page zoning document that had not been comprehensively rewritten since the 1950s. And through Mr. Zients' guidance and expertise was modernized into a mere 400-page document, though sadly without footnotes, to make it more accessible for our residents. And whereas Mr. Zients' dedication to serve the residents of Montgomery County is unparalleled, as he let retirement once again, left retirement once again to apply and accepted the position to become the county's planning board interim chair as the council searched for candidates to fill the full-time role. And whereas Mr. Zients ensured that the hard work of the planning department continued reviewing applications and approving master plans to continue important development efforts across the county. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the county council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes the lifetime of service of Jeffrey Zients, and be it further resolved that we recognize his unwavering professionalism and dedication to serving Montgomery County residents by sharing his passion for regional planning, presented on this 20th day of June, 2023, signed by myself and the council president. Congratulations, Mr. Zients.
Thank you again, Jeffrey Zions, for decades of service to the residents of Montgomery County. Uh, we appreciate your love and dedication to this beautiful community. Um, now, we are going to sit as the district council, uh, and there is a, a zoning text amendment that will be introduced. That is Zoning Text Amendment 2305, Vehicle Parking Design Standards, Commercial Vehicle Parking for Properties with a Residential Use. A public hearing is scheduled for July 25th at 1.30 p.m. I will turn it over to that ZTA sponsor, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, as sometimes is the case, policy ideas come from constituent calls. And I want to thank my Deputy Chief of Staff, Kristen Tribble, who worked with constituents who brought an issue to our attention that we thought deserved worth taking a look at and proposing a possible fix. And I want to thank Navu, Ms. Navu, for all of your hard work on this as well. Um, basically, this was brought to our attention by a couple living in a residential home uh, zone who both use light commercial vehicles, a truck and a van in this instance, in their work. This ETA would expand the options for parking of certain vehicles, specifically light commercial vehicles and residential zones. Currently, the zoning ordinance allows one light commercial vehicle and one recreational vehicle to be parked in certain residential zones. And this ETA uh, would expand to allow either two light commercial vehicles um, or the original one light commercial and one uh, light recreational vehicle. Uh, ironically, RVs may be larger and longer than light commercial vehicles. And as we know, in the current economy, we have a number of residents who are working as entrepreneurs from home uh, in order to be able to make ends meet. And we have some other ZTAs that we're exploring to look at this issue as well. Um, but I think this is um, a reasonable fix of a problem that is impacting local residents, and of course it will go through the legislative process, um, but I am excited and, and um, happy to introduce this amendment to the ZTA today. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz, Ms. Ndu. Nothing to add, thank you. Very good, okay, with that, um, Councilmember Balcom. Um, yes, thank you. I would like to add my name to this uh, ZTA. This is a critical issue for my area in the up county, as you might imagine, thank you. Good. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. And I too would like to add my name. Thank you. And with that, that ZTA is introduced. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, next is an announcement that the Council will hold a public hearing on the pedestrian master plan on July 25th at 1.30 p.m. So everybody who is interested in the pedestrian master plan, there will be a public hearing on July 25th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, so now we're gonna switch gears and the council is pleased to interview two nominees that the county executive has made for uh, director positions. Uh, the first is Mr. Benjamin Stevenson, who has been nominated for the position of the Director of Correction and Rehabilitation. So I would like to invite Mr. Stevenson down. Good afternoon, Ms. Kassiri. Good afternoon, Council President Glass and members of the County Council. I'm Fariba Kassiri, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Chief Administrative Officer Rich Malino, unfortunately couldn't be here today, so I'm glad that I'm here with you on behalf of the CAO to introduce the County Executive's nominee for the Director of Department of Correction and Rehabilitation, Mr. Ben Stevenson. Ben has worked for the County Department of Correction and Rehabilitation for almost three decades, starting as a Correctional Officer and working his way up through the department. He therefore has an incredibly intimate understanding of both Montgomery County and all aspects of DOCR's operations and services. Ben is also considered an expert in his field, having taught as an associate professor at the University of Maryland Global Campus on a variety of correctional topics 
and has been published in a number of related publications. He's incredibly knowledgeable about the role of correction and will truly be an asset as a director. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce to you Benny Stevenson, the County Executive's nominee for the Director of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. Thank, Thank you, you. very <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kassiri. Uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson, welcome. Uh, I have a few questions I'll ask you and then I'll open it up to, to my colleagues as well. Um, First question is, can you tell us about your professional background and how it will relate to the specific duties of the Director of the Department of Corrections? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, I've, I've started in corrections in 1996. It was my first job out of college. Um, needed a job. I had a whole bunch of loans, and it was my first job. Uh, not necessarily my dream job at the time, but it was one that got me uh, in the door that got me experience uh, working in a, in a field that I didn't didn't even think uh, was going to come to come to light. Uh, however, after many years later, I corrections chose me. Uh, I have 27 years of experience. I've worked in corrections from uniform staff and security experience for about six years, another 10 years of experience doing case management, uh, and then the most recent 10 years has been in the administration and the management of corrections. Uh, most of my career has been in the rehabilitative side, where I worked with uh, residents within our Montgomery County's pre-release center, which is a national model on community corrections. Uh, I, I worked as a, a counselor on a youthful offender program back in the day. It was called Moral Recognition Therapy. And we worked with those youthful offenders in trying to change behavior, reduce recidivism, and help those uh, successfully transition into the community. Um, and so I have a passion for what I do. I believe that what we do is helping people. I, I have the fortunate, I am fortunate enough to work for a jail system that is not just the Department of Corrections, but it also has the rehabilitative part. And so with over 10,000 people that come through our system every year, is we have a very specific point in time uh, opportunity to be able to transition and um, help those prior to being released. And so we do that from a jail perspective, and we also do that from a community corrections perspective. Um, my experience uh, is being a knowledge expert in corrections, is I am an American Correctional Association auditor, as well as I'm a prior Prison Rape Elimination Act auditor with the Department of Justice. Uh, I know standards, I know accreditation. Uh, I've worked through many different accreditations uh, uh, throughout my time, as well as inspected many different prisons, state prisons, federal prisons, uh, local prisons across the country. Uh, and I looked at those as opportunities to seek out anything that we did or they do differently and be able to bring back to Montgomery County. However, I will tell you, there's not a lot to bring back because we have a model system. Uh, we've always had a model system. And despite what people may say, is our corrections and our staff do difficult, challenging work every day. Uh, they have worked particularly hard during a recent COVID, which I was part of. Uh, the management team, the staff, uh, we all showed up. There's no tele-jail. We had to be on site and continue to be in providing and making sure that we have a secure, safe, and a rehabilitative program within our system. Uh, and so I, I have experience uh, working with unions, working with um, working with labor to get to common goals, to understand we may have differences, but work through them and make sure that our operations is safe and sound and respectful and has a positive culture. Uh, throughout my career, I took every opportunity. Uh, moving through the ranks, I've been promoted eight different times with eight different positions. Uh, however, I, I saw every chance to be part of something as an opportunity to help improve our system, improve our process, improve our jail and, and contribute to those that are coming through our system, our returning citizens of Montgomery County. Uh, so based on looking over my career of security experience, facility experience, uh, programs, services, I believe, and I, I believe I'm not only qualified for the job, but I am dedicated to Montgomery County and have been. Uh, and I, I, I'm so happy to have this opportunity today in front of you to explain my history. Thank you for sharing that history with us. Uh, you, you mentioned a few moments ago uh, COVID and mm -hmm. the pandemic, and so my next question is mm -hmm. about returning uh, mm -hmm. to uh, normal or improved operations mm -hmm. within the facility uh, now that we've turned a corner. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. Um, being proud of a very difficult time, the last three years have not been normal. Uh, normal has been trying to keep everyone safe and to do it with a group of, of managers and staff every day. And, and we've done an incredible job in making sure that we did not lose control medically of a jail through our classification, through um, uh, paying attention to a two jail system of where people transition and where they're located and to make sure they're safe and to make sure that we, we kept our operations um, uh, COVID responsible. We did an outstanding job. We also gained valuable knowledge uh, from what we've done. And some of the things with COVID as we return to normal is I want, we should look to the advantages of what we've learned, the lessons learned. And so some of those would, would be improving our staff safety, looking at um, the security of our inmates and staff, looking at innovative technology that we use to get us and pivot us through some very critical points that we can now use to better serve our residents, to serve our citizens. Uh, I also look at opportunities as we just opened up our diversion programs on February 12th, which was huge. Our diversion programs are our first opportunity to get people from not being in our system, for one. So we started the Alternative Community Service Program on February uh, 12th, and then most recently our pre-release center, which is currently open with a today's count of 48 residents that are in our center. And so that is a 50-year-old program, which we have a 50th year anniversary this year, as well as our departments, uh, is huge in opening that back up. Uh, we also need to look at uh, remote options, and I talked about the innovative technology. Using video and having more access for our um, inmates, residents, defendants, clients, uh, we have the opportunity to um, look at that innovative technology to expand our education or our group services and how we can um, uh, provide more services to our inmates. Um, a couple examples of that that I would say is, is looking at video visiting, looking at tablets, looking at ways where we have some major IT projects that allow us to have Wi-Fi in our building uh, that is currently a project right now are, 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 are huge for us. And so we've learned a lot of good lessons and I believe moving forward, expanding these reentry programs is where we need to be. Uh, particularly because during COVID, when all our inmates uh, were not in a lot of programs because we had minimal programs, no one was earning good conduct time. And so those are state statutory earned credits in which good behavior and program time uh, can be awarded if, if programs existed. And so expanding these and reopening them this fall was, was crucial to our department. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, the council and the county executive are committed to implementing racial equity initiatives within county government. And so what are some of the situations where DOCR can help achieve equitable outcomes for criminal justice uh, involved individuals? Uh, we don't choose who comes through our doors. However, we do have an obligation and a dedication to make sure that we would provide a equitable access to those that come through, our clients. Our first aspect is to review our, our programs to make sure that our access and our accessibility to these programs are, are laid out for, for our staff or for our um, inmates. Uh, with our country having a history of systematic racism, our department works closely to undo these effects and provide reentry programs, not just in our jail, because everyone thinks reentry, they think of community corrections. However, you have to have reentry programs in our jail. And I would tout our jail as that national model that has, I mean, imagine how many jails in our country have Montgomery College or have a college affiliate working directly inside your center or a public library working and operating exactly in your center. Uh, we are working on a bakery program that, that just started about three to four weeks ago that's going to have its first graduating class in two to three weeks, providing culinary art skills, those bakery skills. These are tangible things that lead to jobs and hopefully lead to reducing people coming back into our system. And so I do believe we have a lot of growth to look at coming out of COVID to look at our programs and make sure that they align with evidence-based practices and they show to metrics, metrics that show that they work. And so I, I look forward to, to leading that, working with the Public Safety Committee, working with council, working with county leadership and, and, and continuing our model of being the national model of corrections, but working more towards achieving those goals and reducing recidivism and showing progressive correctional practices. Thanks for, for sharing with us uh, 
the, the upcoming class, this graduating yes. class. Yeah. Um, can you also share with us some of the short-term and long-term goals that you have for the department? Sure. Our, our first short term is staffing. Uh, like any other agency, we are struggling with getting people that want to work in a jail. And, and imagine, just right off the bat, uh, we've got to change our narrative. We've got to recruit. We need to look at our colleges, our universities, uh, other partners where we can get people that want to work in our system. And, and it's not just correctional officers. We have a nursing vacancy. We have seven nurse vacancies today. Uh, we have challenges. We have to provide constitutional health care, and so having these staff is highly important and part of our, our immediate short-term goal. We also, uh, just because COVID happened doesn't mean that there isn't contraband, there isn't uh, issues of drug interdiction or drug, drug introduction into our jail, and so we have to be to on top of that with technology, with staffing, and with training. Uh, mental health access. Uh, making sure that we understand that the work that we're doing right now is significantly difficult. We have 45 people today that are committed to the Department of Public Health and there's no bed space. And so we are handling some of the most toughest cases every day while we await bed space. And so those challenges from a legislative perspective to a day-to-day -day handling perspective and the amount of overtime that is consumed by the increase uh, acute mental health issues that are going on in our jail. But I, I say that to say is we also have to look out for the officers that are dealing with this day in, day out. Okay, officer resiliency and looking at mental health uh, access uh, to those that um, are experiencing significant, difficult jobs every day. And then the last thing I would say is finalizing our IT uh, um, uh, projects. We have two that are huge. One I mentioned was the Wi-Fi project. That will allow us to be able to expand programming remotely throughout our jail. And we're also doing it at Community Corrections. And then we're also going to go live in two weeks for the first ever electronic health record. And this is huge because it started with the previous director, Angela Talley, as her commitment when she became a director. And we're finalizing this program that will reduce liability, improve our health care to our to those, we have the most precious inventory, inmates, residents, clients, defendants, and so that is that is very, very huge for us. Uh, and then the long-term goals that I think, um, excuse me one sec, long-term goals, uh, again, going back to innovative technology, looking where we can uh, uh, take away redundancy in processes and align our, 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 our um, department to where we can better serve people through through the use of technology. Uh, expand again our reentry programs. Uh, address our aging facilities. We have one jail that's 50 years of age. Uh, and when you walk in it, you'll know it. You can smell it. You can see it. You can see the conditions of it. And then we have our newest jail, which is still almost coming to 20 years of age. And so our long-term goals is to make sure we're paying attention to those facility needs, locks, doors, systems, those type of things often do uh, age out in the longevity or life expectancy of buildings. And then one that's on our horizon on long term is the construction of our new jail. Uh, a jail and making sure that we are a state of the art intake jail that's uh, coming across in probably the next five or seven years, uh, as well as looking at our uh, diversion center and working with our partners, with HHS, to understand that we both have similar populations and a diversion center being close to our jail can help reduce our jail population as well. So those are our long-term priorities. Thank you for enumerating those. Uh, last question for me, are there any conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? No, I have no conflicts. Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm now gonna turn it over to the Chair of the Public Safety Committee, Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. Um, you are literally standing on the shoulders of who I believe some of the finest, perhaps the finest, directors of correction and rehabilitation in the United States. And I mean that mm -hmm. sincerely. We can start with Art Wallenstein. Mm -hmm. We can start with Rob Green. We can talk about Angela Talley. And we're going to talk about mm -hmm. a fellow by the name of Ben Stevenson as well. I look forward to voting for you uh, because you certainly deserve this. Just a few weeks ago, I, and no one should ever say they had the pleasure of being in, in the Clarksburg <laughs> facility. They should not, they should not say that. But I, I went to the Clarksburg facility for the GED and Montgomery College graduations. And 
though because of I had gone there several years prior, but because of COVID, things had changed, and we didn't have those those uh, that those events there. You didn't have those events there, but it really brings back to all of us the fact that most all I guess were young people who had gotten themselves in a situation that they certainly didn't want to get caught in they their families were not happy that they were in that situation but the graduation itself perhaps was one of the first times or one of the few times that the families realized that this young person is going to get themselves straightened mm -hmm. out and in a better in a better way and um and i have to tell you that that uh i've seen you run the facilities in a uh, as a champion uh, to run the facilities in a fair and and uh, responsible manner and your staff is with you every step of the way as you mentioned before and I know a couple are back there uh, I, they couldn't get any further back they'd be <laughs> in the city of Rockville City Hall if there they were but but um, but your staff is with you every step of the way you the, the director mm -hmm. sets the tone mm -hmm. but the staff obviously the, is the group that does it uh, on, on an hourly, moment, momentarily basis, and you have to deal with all those issues you talked about, the mental health issues. I've been to the pre-release center, and in fact, we'll go again this week, and, and it's a national model, and it's a model that we all are proud of, and that we need to make certain that we continue to be proud of. Re rehabilitative services are so very important, but when, when a person is in, incarcerated, I have to applaud the fact that I, I've been there for one of your graduations and the, the keynote speaker said, uh, use the, 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 ter uh, the uh, title of their uh, statement was no U-turns. These young people have gotten themselves there, they've gotten themselves their GEDs and, and certificates and we don't want you back. There's no U-turns. Get yourself back on track and we need to help you do that. I applaud the fact that you restarted the bakery. The bakery was there before. Uh, you, I know that you've talked about, I was standing there when you were talking to Montgomery College about the idea of a culinary beyond. Um, it, it's, it seems strange, but one of the discussions that, that, were, that were, was uh, had was the fact that, thank goodness, not everybody stays there for the entire time. And we had to make certain, you had to make certain, that the programs were something that they could get certificates for, even if they were there just for a, a shorter amount of time. And, and, you know, a shorter amount of time that can be there. And I know that you said that uh, Montgomery County does a very good job in comparison to others, and obviously I, I agree with that. But I also have to ask you if even if the great job that we're doing, if there's any additional program, is there other things like the bakery, like the culinary, that, and you don't have to answer it at the top of your head, but if there are programs like that, so that someone who has gotten themselves in this situation can get a, an occupation that will uh, uh, get them a good, uh, a, a good salary, whether it be in the trades, whatever it is, if there's something we can do for that, please don't hesitate to let us know. Yes, we have budgetary problems, but there are certain things that we cannot afford not to do. It's always been my understanding it costs about $45,000 to incarcerate a per, a, a, an adult, a, a youth is even more. But for $45,000, if we can spend the money up front, or if we can spend the money so that that young person doesn't go through that, then we need to do it. And that's just the cost to the person. That's not the cost to the families. That's not the cost to the to the uh, community. And so, um, if you can think of something off the top of your head, I'd I'd like to hear it. But if sure. not, if you want to think about it, I'll certainly give you that advantage as well. Um, thank you, Council Member Katz. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to have to look at the challenges of the community is not back to normal yet. We, we're starting to get back to normal, but not everybody is. And so uh, our, our leadership staff have talked about the availability of substance abuse treatment not being out in the community as readily as it once was prior to COVID. And so uh, I do believe internally, we should start getting uh, maybe a system-wide or, or a county-wide, not county-wide, um, a department-wide 
program that deals with the cognitive behavioral therapy that is that is aligned and has the continuity of care from arrest to to release is I believe that I would I would like uh, my leadership and our leadership to be aligning our services that make sense at every point of intercept and they have a continuum to it and so I do believe we need more face time because the evidence says is the more time or the the more dosage of treatment leads to the better outcome of, of success and, and reduces recidivism. And so those are some that we're going to be having those conversations in future of how we can do that differently. All right, thank you. And I, uh, as I said, I look forward to, to voting for you. You've done a great job and I know you will do a great job. And with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Uh, excellent questions and comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Council Member Juwando. Thank you, I appreciate uh, the opportunity and appreciate your service and uh, Glad you've dedicated yourself to, uh, you know, one of the things we often talk about when we when we started Summer Rise was like, you don't know what you don't know. You get into something, you try it out, and you like it, and or you don't, and in, this, in your case, it's it turned into a lifelong dedication. So uh, thank you for your service. Um, you know, kind of following on Council Member Katz's question, you know, mm -hmm. this, we need innovation. We need progressivity. You mentioned some of these words uh, in your presentation. Uh, and I think the criminal justice system and corrections and rehabilitation being a, a part of that uh, is an area where we need it desperately, um, and, and especially what we're coming out of. Um, and so I have two, two questions for you which are kind of connected to that. Um, I read your in your bio you uh, wrote a report on um, electronic monitoring devices mm -hmm. a few years, 10 year plus mm -hmm. years ago. Um, what in the, their uses and utility and, and the appropriate way to use them? Are we uh, right now, how many roughly people are under your supervision using those devices? Um, I would say about 150 are under pretrial supervision, which are court ordered by the judge, which right. we may have a you know, an influence in it. At our pre-release center, we are probably under 10. Under 10. Mm -hmm. And who pays the fees for the electronic monitoring? Uh, we do. Uh, that is that is a county contract that we have with BI Incorporated. Right. And we, the government pays, right? The individuals yes. are not responsible. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, do you have uh, an idea of, and is that program, how do you think that's working? Um, I believe it gives us accountability when we're taking at-risk folks that otherwise may not have an opportunity for community corrections or may not be accepted. How, however, I don't believe that we uniformly have policies that could further stigmatize or further have people look as if they're scary because they may have an ankle bracelet. And so we have to be very judicious in how we use them. Um, and I also I'm interested in talking about innovation is there's other technology with our current vendor that does stuff that's more risk watch oriented that has less of that stigmatization because it's nothing worse than having one of your residents of your program feel a certain way riding a metro and people are scared do they step back or doing a job interview and so we are very conscious of that and I would like to look at alternatives when we can uh, so it doesn't look as as I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think electronic monitoring you've done well is a mm -hmm. good thing. We want more people mm -hmm. in the community and building their mm -hmm. life to getting it together. But we, again, we don't want these mm -hmm. impediments and the visible right. of the ankle bracelet can be a part of that. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And the second question I have is just related to the um, the state re MOU reentry program that kind of my understanding, mm -hmm. you can correct me if wrong, kind of went on hold during the yes. pandemic for the last three years, mm -hmm. and this is the program that would allow people to be released 12 to 18 mm -hmm. months in advance to start acclimating themselves again yes. to be successful. Uh, where are we with that? Are we gonna start implementing that? We have our iterations to our memorandum of understanding already reviewed by our county attorney and we're waiting for the state to respond. Okay. Uh, as of last week, I asked for a status of that and I'm awaiting from the state because I do need and I would like to continue that program because the folks that we take for that are returning Montgomery County citizens. And right. so, in essence, that is a reverse sentencing and an opportunity for them to be closer to the loved ones for that transition of release. That's very, very important. Prior to COVID, we had at the pre-release center, I can speak for the pre-release center at that time, we had about 20 to 25 
folks from the state local reentry program. And so we want to continue that and we are waiting. Uh, I will further add that we do not have in place our federal contract yet, but we are working and meeting back in September to look at for, about returning citizens for the federal to come back to our county as well. I appreciate that, and I agree with you. That's an important part of making sure folks are successful. So I, I look forward to voting for you. look forward to working with you on these and other issues. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Probe. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I now know we graduated from college the same year, so uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know how very seriously you take the rehabilitation portion of this work because while there's a consequence imposed by the judicial system, the goal is, of course, that it doesn't happen again and that we're doing whatever we can to make sure people are successful uh, when they come out. Um, and I know that we are a model, and sometimes mm -hmm. when people are a model for things, uh, they, they sort of go, I've got it right, I'm doing all the things. And that's never the case because we have to have forward momentum. And now, if you'll be moving into this position, if you could give me what your big picture items are um, of what you see as needed, necessary, positive change forward so that we maintain our position as that model and um, particularly with respect to the rehabilitative services portion. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, council member. Uh, I, I, I'm educated, um, I come from an education background, my master's in education, I also have a distance education background. Uh, uniquely enough during COVID, we've learned the importance of remote, remote mm -hmm. working, uh, flexibility, uh, having access to things to the outside world that we otherwise didn't think about I believe we need to work on a model, a model of success for GED, for mm -hmm. college education, that can work not just in the detention services side, but also the community corrections. And that model would be with our partners, Montgomery College. There's no other person to do that with. But I believe that we're going to have to look at being very nimble in a very short period of time. Our pretrial length of stay, the average mm -hmm. days in which a pretrial inmate stays in our jail is 210 days. And at the pre-release center, it goes down even further to right. 92 days. Right. And so with that period of time, our challenge is going to be is how do we put together re-entry on whether it takes a week to put something together that could be basic to something that could be certificate-based if they're there longer. And so I am a believer with you. It's just because we're a model and we have all these years of history of doing the first of things doesn't mean we always stay there. And so we are going to have to to push that needle for us, and particularly out of COVID, with, mm -hmm. with less staff, we're going to have mm -hmm. to be flexible differently. And I see opportunities, uh, you can call them challenges, but I do see them as opportunities where we can do things different and more flexible. Thank you, and mm -hmm. with respect to the GED, and mm -hmm. especially for those who may have been mm -hmm. on track or working through, mm -hmm. um, but then they're coming, they, they're eligible to come mm -hmm. here and come back into the community, um, and they come through your program, but they're only there for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Is there a potential or possibility for you to take on the, the finishing of incomplete GED work that's happening in the state correctional facilities? Mm -hmm. uh, we can start wherever a person is. Okay. We meet, you know, our, our usual motto is meet people where they are, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if we get someone who's a sixth, seventh year uh, education, we can work with that and start the at least first processes towards achieving that GED. Okay. At the pre-release center, you are required to have to work on it mm -hmm. if you're under the age of 45. I right. don't know where we came with 45, but, <laughs> but that's what we've been doing for a while. And sometimes we've had people older than that that have chosen because they were close. Right. And so imagine operating a one-room schoolhouse of many different educational levels. Mm -hmm. We do that so delicately, it's probably one of the most challenging things that we do, but we are we do make it work and we are able to get some graduations or refer it prior to release out in the community. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and good afternoon, Mr. Stevenson. Um, I believe we first crossed paths at the reentry center in Rockville. Um, we came to look at the facilities and met some of the young women that were in the facility. So um, thank you for your continued interest in service in this area. Um, I also noticed that you served on our reimagining public safety task force. 
it's really helpful to have that mixture of subject matter experts and the community um, when we were talking about how to reimagine um, public safety in the community. And just wanted to find out a little bit more about some of the lessons that um, you know you learned or that you teach that you mm -hmm. want to bring to the director's office. You have extensive re mm -hmm. um, experience, um, not just in the field, but with your degrees in education um, and with your work with um, analyzing and assessing um, facilities for accreditation across the country. So would love to hear some of the innovative ideas in addition to the um, job completion ideas that you have to bring to the director's office. Sure, th thank you, Council Member. Um, the reimagining public safety, I, I, I will say that, you know, I, I sat as a non-voting member to, to be a knowledge expert for corrections as a whole. And some of the things in which we've already begun to address uh, have started, and I, I wanted to say is the reduction of fees. Uh, for years, we were collecting fees, and we're collecting fees from uh, from you know a disadvantaged population already. And so that elimination already took place when we opened up our diversion programs on February 12th. We are no longer collecting $350 or $175 for our diversion. Um, we still collect fees for our community corrections program, but that is because we do that to have efficacy and it's a nominal amount proportionally right but we did some work in trying to understand is building these barriers for these for for collecting money didn't make any sense and so I'm, I'm proud to say we stopped that and we also stopped weekend or work crew fees as well and so that was one to where we would take folks over the weekend and do weekend or work crews and collect fees on top of that mm -hmm. um, a couple things that I thought were valuable that I would I think we need to do is it, within my leadership is to look at analyzing our programs and making sure that they align with the population we serve and look at an external review of what can we do more to make sure that our outcomes measure up to the evidence okay and and our programs are aligned with that and and I believe we do a good job I don't I don't believe we're perfect we, we have issues like every other department but we do have some room to grow. And I think having feedback and thinking that we're the best and be all is not the way to approach this. I believe we need to, post COVID, look and assess how we were doing business, what has changed in our judiciary and our sentencing, and how, how do we best serve our population that we have differently. And so I looked at those recommendations prior to today. I went through them and uh, I see opportunity in how we can address them differently moving forward. Sounds good. Um, we brought this up briefly during the um, one of our HHS meetings when we were talking about um, recidivism and reentry programs and even the classification of nonviolent drug offenses, especially mm -hmm. those related to marijuana, mm -hmm. where within days of its recreational legalization July 1st and I'm just thinking about some of the people that are still serving those sentences and any ideas around innovative ways of um, um, treating those as public health issues and making recommendations to this body on how to approach that. Uh, I've not seen the numbers uh, on that, okay. uh, on how many people is this affecting. Yeah. Uh, I, I would probably need a conversation with HHS or the state's attorney's office to look at that in whatever way corrections can be part of it, like particularly expungements. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. And yeah. it's huge for our population that already is going in front of an employer trying to uh, not uh, trying to get their best job and put their best foot forward, but having to explain mm -hmm. things that may not have taken its total expungement. They have not gone and gotten have been disposed of and so mm -hmm. I would I would work with both those offices to make sure that, that we look at that uh, we're also gonna we had a program called the intervention program for substance abusers it was often called our first time marijuana user program uh, it, it we are no longer operating that and we have suspended it knowing that this law of the recreational use is coming up we have offered to the courts mm -hmm. we are willing to supervise and deflect 
anybody in a diversion program a little bit differently than what we've done in years past to help and to hopefully help get someone an expunged record. And so that's what our diversion programs do. In the end of your completion, we help you expunge your program. And so we wow. will continue to be part of that to deflect people from coming through our system. Thank you so much for your responses. Looking forward to working with you, sir. All right, thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilmember Albernos. Uh, thank you, it's good to see you, Mr. Stevenson. So I uh, appreciate the questions and comments of colleagues. I very much associate myself uh, with the comments of uh, um, sorry, um, with everybody. Um, so, uh, thank you. No, uh, particularly Councilmember Katz. Um, so I. That's right. That's right. Yes. Thank you. That's right. Uh, no, just because um, directors Wallenstein, Green, uh, and Tally were mm -hmm. colleagues uh, in the former administration, yeah. and so I saw firsthand their work, not just in their presentations before the council during committee sessions, but also in their partnerships with other county agencies, mm -hmm. very creative programming ideas with the Department of Recreation, the Department mm -hmm. of Health and Human Services, and a uh, county executive who really supported that innovation, and I believe the current one does as well. So there are certainly, we're never gonna have enough resources or money uh, or budget to be able to address all the myriad of needs that we have. But I know you will, but I encourage you to continue that tradition of thinking creatively uh, within county government framework and structure and programs um, to be able to, to serve our community um, in a way that I think is really gonna be helpful. Um, this was a tough budget. Um, I know that we did not get everything that we wanted to get through through. Um, recruitment and retention is a big issue that you and our entire country are facing uh, in first responder positions right now, but particularly within corrections. Could you just uh, talk a little bit about uh, an acknowledgement that again, money's a challenge, but what are some of the ideas that you have to address some of the recruitment and retention issues? Sure, Th thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, I, believe, I believe we need to look at our culture, our training. We need to look at incentivizing, uh, not to high degrees, but to some degrees that are comparable to what other correctional agencies are doing. We have correctional agencies across the country, or across the state that are also doing mm -hmm. uh, incentives, and those incentives are hiring bonuses, and um, I'm not aware of retention bonuses, but I do think we may need to look in that direction because there, there is a level of, of where we're not gonna get the return if we don't have our hiring in place, and that impacts services, and those, those are the things that I wanna make sure that we have a continuity of operations that are providing the best rehabilitative programs. And so um, we have done some marketing blitzes right now. We're doing billboards posted right out some competitive places. Let's just say that, that I, I believe um, could result in more people that are interested in corrections. Another idea is, is we haven't done tours in three years. And so most people relate a jail to what they saw on TV or in movies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to invite people in. We have to partner with our universities. We have to partner with paid internships or regular academic internships to bring people in that would otherwise, like myself, not even think of, hey, I'm gonna apply and start working at a jail and end up loving it 30 years later. So uh, I think we have a, a large uh, area to move on trying to get ourselves positioned uh, to hire more, and I think we're moving in the right direction. I appreciate that, and actually, connecting a dot so there has been some concern and opposition to the restoration center and being yes. close to the yes. current corrections facility but as you just mentioned I don't think there's a full appreciation understanding of the level of supports and programming that we have within our corrections facilities here in Montgomery County mm -hmm. that are unique um, and I think that's that's an important component um, the final thing I'll say for now is uh, in following up in Councilmember Sales' comments, we, we would love uh, to explore a joint committee session in the future um, with public safety to see how we can think even more creatively, mm -hmm. particularly in the space of mental health, mm -hmm. um, which continues to be an ongoing challenge that we're seeing for a variety of reasons, and I think there's going to be a lot of synergy. Um, and I enjoyed serving on the Public Safety Committee um, and always appreciated Director Talley's updates. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's an opportunity for more collaboration. But thank you, I look forward to supporting your nomination and I appreciate the County Executive bringing you forward. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for your comments and questions. And Mr. Stevenson, we look forward to working with you. Uh, we will um, take this up at the next council session, um, but we know that there is a lot of work to get done. Uh, you are absolutely up for the task, uh, and the creativity and the track record which you bring to this position um, are very welcome and needed at this time. So we look forward to working with you. All right. Thank Sorry. you very much. I want to thank you all, thank the Public Safety Committee, as well as uh, the County Executive and, and the nomination. So thank you for today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Kasiri, I presume you're going to stay for for the next one up. Uh, and he just walked in for the second interview of the afternoon. And it is with Mr. Scott Bruton, who is the county executive's nominee to be the director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. I'll let him catch his breath. And he's all caught up. There he goes. OK. Um, Ms. Kasiri. Hello again, Council President Glass and uh, members of the County Council. I'm again here on behalf of the Chief Administrative Officer, Richard Malino, to introduce another of our wonderful candidates for an appointed position. The County Executive is pleased to be nominating Mr. Scott Bruton as the Director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Scott has been a leader in the area of housing policy and programs for over a decade and has expertise in the area of affordable housing, which is particular in importance to both the County Executive and the County Council. As an expert in the field of housing policy, Scott's work has been published by organizations such as the Center for Urban Policy Research, and he has deep expertise researching, developing, and implementing housing policies and programs. Scott is also well-versed in internal aspects of county government and housing issues in Montgomery County, thanks to his work as deputy and acting director of DHCA. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce to Scott Bruton, the County Executive's nominee for the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Thank you very much, Ms. Kasiri. Mr. Bruton, welcome. Um, I have a few questions for you. We'll open it up for a conversation and um, look forward to this discussion. And so uh, most recently is your time serving as Acting Director of DHCA. What, what would you say are your major accomplishments thus far? and, and uh, how will these achievements contribute to your long-term success within the department? Thank you uh, for the question, Council uh, President Glass, and uh, thank you all for having me here today uh, for this interview or confirmation hearing. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Look forward to the conversation. Um, so I think I should start off with uh, probably my be my greatest achievement so far is that I've led efforts to increase collaboration uh, between uh, the department. Uh, the county executive, the council, uh, the PHP committee on the council, and our affordable housing providers within the community. Um, examples include uh, working with Council Vice President Friedson on the Nonprofit Preservation Fund uh, under his leadership, trying to move that forward uh, as a source for uh, affordable housing funding for the preservation of affordable housing in the county. Um, also working with the county executive and a variety of folks on the council and your staff in uh, revising or uh, commenting on the rent stabilization legislation, uh, which hopefully will come to pass uh, in, in a you know, uh, collaborative form in the next couple of months. Uh, also have been working with uh, Council Vice President Friedson on amendments uh, to the right of first refusal legislation uh, to make sure that it is more practicable uh, and better able to serve the needs of the county and low and moderate income residents. Um, I've also uh, increased trans worked with uh, the PHP committee to increase the transparency for our affordable housing pipeline uh, to try to make sure that's shared with the council and the county executive so that there are fewer misunderstandings um, and so that you all can see what we, exactly what we're doing well and what we're not doing well if it should come to that. Um, I've established department-wide 
uh, data collection, maintenance, and analysis initiatives uh, in order to increase the transparency uh, of our activities, to share greater information across the government, and to increase the synergy of our uh, uh, statutory regulatory and regulatory uh, efforts. Um, I've, I reorganized the CDBG CV2 Rent Assistance Program. Uh, for the past few years since it was created, it had spent not any money on rental assistance. Um, over the past five and a half months uh, since we began to reform it, uh, it is now on its way to spending the majority of its $300 million, sorry, $3 million, I wish it was $300 million, <laughs> $3 million of allocated rental assistance by the end of the summer. Um, I also created and continue to lead our uh, troubled uh, common Ownership Communities Working Group. Uh, I mentioned this as an initiative when I first met with you all for the Deputy Director position as something that I see as uh, a, a, a really kind of an unrealized need in the county that there are many troubled common ownership communities that could benefit from technical assistance from the department as well as new funding sources to help dig them out uh, so that they do not lose their homes and become displaced. Um, I completed, I worked with our staff uh, uh, to complete the negotiation and closing of a large naturally occurring affordable housing property through the ROFR process. Hopefully, I think there will be a press release tomorrow and we'll be able to go into more detail about uh, that at that time. Uh, but I don't want to you know, get ahead on announcing any of those things. Um, and I've worked on expanding the use uh, of rental agreements for up to 15 years as compared to the five uh, that had been standards for, in, in, for extending MPDUs. But now we can use this, this expand, these expanded rental agreements to significantly increase affordable housing at existing properties that are not going through a sale. Um, and so we can be much more strategic about where we are placing this kind of affordability. And then finally, I established uh, a new initiative to increase departmental capacity to apply for federal and state funding for neighborhood revitalization projects. And we'll get more into that in some of the, probably some of the future questions. Sure, well, let's uh, dive a little deeper into some of that. And if appointed, what are some of your short-term and long-term goals for housing and community development within the county? Thank you. Um, I will start again, and I'll probably echo this multiple times throughout the questions, that um, my main mission is going to be to increase collaboration. Uh, between all the different parts of government, the executive branches, especially DHCA, uh, the council, um, and especially the, the Housing Opportunities Commission and our other uh, collaborators in the uh, uh, local affordable housing pipeline. Uh, I know from many things I've learned over the past several months that there have been deficits in uh, maintaining and nurturing those responsibilities. Um, and it seems to be a common desire among all those that I've mentioned uh, to strengthen these, uh, to these uh, relationships. And in that way, uh, we can all uh, work much better to preserve a greater, greater amount of affordable housing and to do it more cost effectively for the county. Um, I, I can never. Uh, I could not answer this question without saying that there is a need for money, lots more money, um, and so one of the things I will always be doing, uh, you know, come budget time each year, is asking for increases in county funding for the preservation and creation of affordable housing. Um, but we won't just be asking for additional money from the county, from from the county citizens. We will also be looking to entice. Um, impacted investors so that we can leverage their investments with the county investments to drastically increase the amount of affordable housing that we can uh, preserve and create in the county on a yearly basis. And I do make a point to say impact investors because impact investors are looking for a, a lower return on their investment. They're still looking for a return. Uh, instead of 15 to 18 percent, they may be looking for you know 11 to 13 percent. But still, when you're talking tens of millions of dollars, that's a lot of money. Um, also, uh, it's important. I mentioned uh, our database efforts earlier. Uh, short and long-term goal is to create a unified back-end database for all DHCA uh, uh, activities. Um, We'll do this by creating a common identifier 
they determine if that's a tax ID number or something else uh, that we can use to link all of our activities with everything from single family ownership and rental all, th all the way through the largest multifamily properties so that we can have synergy behind the scenes and make sure that our databases are no longer siloed so that whenever we look up a property, we'll be able to see what type of affordability is it, does it have? When was it built? Does it have any housing code violations? What's the status of its licensing? Um, has it filled out its annual rent survey? All of those kinds of things, because there are many parts of the law, of our laws and regulations that say you cannot go forward with this unless you've done that. And many times now, we don't know, you know our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing as far as enforcement. So that's really important. Um, as I'll say, as I said before, and as I'll reinforce over and over again, um, going to be looking to increase federal, state, and local funding for DHCA's uh, neighborhood revitalization section. And this is mostly to facilitate commercial corridor improvements in disinvested areas of the county, uh, but there will also be, and I'll talk about this, well, I'll talk about this next, uh, we're also looking to incorporate the troubled uh, common ownership community working group into our collaboration between our Office of Common Ownership Communities and Neighborhood Revitalization, because our neighborhood, neighborhood revitalization section has the uh, experience um, and knowledge to make the, to, to help uh, carry forward the improvements needed and manage uh, the funding that would be going to these common ownership communities uh, for, uh, to try to improve them. Thank you for that. Uh, if appointed, how would you support D DHCA's workforce to ensure that they meet department goals? Uh, and what challenges do you think the department faces in achieving those goals? I think about this question every day. Um, we have about 110 folks in the department, and that may be growing with some of the bills that you all are, are considering over the next few months. Um, I will say that DHCA has an excellent team in our community development, finance, and housing divisions, and we are working to produce, uh, pr improve our productivity and effectiveness um, through our labor policies and through our hiring practices. I will note that one, well, I'll come to that back in challenges. Um, I have worked on increasing our engagement with McGeo represent, representatives uh, and stewards to improve collaborations. And uh, we're also uh, restarting the Labor Management Relations Committee uh, that had kind of fallen apart and with disuse, especially during COVID. Um, and these these meetings with labor representatives are occurring monthly. Uh, to, and we're you know, giving each other to-do lists uh, and following up regularly on it. Um, I'm also, uh, as I promised to do in my original hearing for Deputy Director, uh, to hold individual meetings uh, with all the members of the staff uh, to try to get to know them uh, on an individual basis, what experience they have, where they come from, what their interests are. And at the end of each meeting, I always ask them, uh, what is DHC doing well um, the, you know, that we want to protect, and what could DHCA be doing? Because they have a perspective uh, on the ground, you know, day-to-day -day work that I don't have. Um, challenges. Uh, we need to, as you all experienced uh, when we came to you for the FY24 budget hearing, uh, we have a need to increase staffing uh, for our licensing, landlord-tenant uh, relations, uh, common ownership communities, and grants and contracts management. Um, the uh, county executive and the PHP committee both endorsed uh, some of our uh, requests for additional staffing. We know and we sympathize that it was a difficult budget year and we are going to be uh, collecting data and we'll come back to you again uh, and the county executive again uh, to, you know, to provide you our justifications and you all will you know, determine if we are you know, working in a way that deserves the extra staffing. Um, I mentioned before we need better data integration. I won't go you know, fur much further into that, but data integration is key to us being able to do the job more effectively with our staffing constraints. And also, uh, there are a lot of revenues that we're leaving on the table because we are not adequately following up on citations uh, and dealing with them. And that's not only a matter of revenue, but it's all, many times a matter of uh, public safety. And so it's very important for us to go forward with. Um, 
And we also need to improve intra-departmental collaboration for regulatory responsibilities and to facilitate implementation of new initiatives. So the things I had already mentioned, and the last one I'll mention on that is that uh, the department has not been doing as good as it should have in creating individual performance plans for each coming year. And so, you know, if you're going to evaluate people, you're going to, you know, give someone an appraisal at the end of the year, and you haven't given them clear objectives as to what they're supposed to be doing and uh, quantifiable levels of achievement, then it's hard to hold them accountable. Um, and so both for our responsibilities as uh, supervisors, but also uh, just uh, for the sanity of our, of our staff, it's important for, that we put forward these each year. And so we're going to be revising our uh, performance plans for every staff member uh, for the coming year. Thank you. Uh, just a few more questions. Uh, what do you see as the most promising strategies for preserving existing affordable housing? I'll say it. In, I'll, I'll say the first one in brief. Increase collaboration. Uh, that's the best tool uh, we have to make sure we're, we don't have redundant efforts and that we are not increasing competition uh, between the various different uh, affordable housing developers. Um, second, uh, the money thing. Uh, always increase funding and increase, you know, our uh, recruitment of those who have money to contribute. Uh, you know, the impact investors I mentioned earlier. Uh, increase the use, as I mentioned earlier, of the long-term extendable rental agreements. This can help us work much more strategically across the county. Uh, increase the exercise of ROFR, uh, knock wood, assuming that we get the, uh, the ROFR amendments passed, that we won't have to hold a bunch of cash in our accounts to be able to buy a property and then resell it right away. We'll just have to put in the property, I mean, the amount of money we're going to leave in long term. And so that'll allow us to be much more effective in the use of this decades old law. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned with the troubled COCs, provide technical guidance and funding assistance uh, to help prevent the failure and displacement from these uh, home ownership communities. And then, I know this is a particular, particular instance to uh, Vice President Friedson, is increased funding for the retrofit and rehabilitation programs such as Design for Life uh, to make sure that um, low and moderate income senior citizens as well as residents with a disability uh, can remain in the homes that they own. Um, thank you. What measures would you take to advance racial equity and social justice within the department and countywide? Thank you for the question. Uh, this uh, DEI, just for the acronym, uh, I guess an unpopular acronym now across the country, but one that thankfully is valued in, in uh, Montgomery County, uh, has been behind my work in housing since I began doing work on the Navajo Reservation uh, back in the summer of 2000 on housing, and, on housing issues and access to housing. Um, I believe that all aspects of DHCA's work must be driven by goals to achieve greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, DHCA is proud that our FY24 department level budget received a score of three, uh, which demonstrates our strong commitment to advancing racial equity and social justice in Montgomery County. We hope to continue that each year and to make sure that all of our sub-scores within that also get up to a three. Um, I will collaborate with the county's Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice and the Office of Community Partnerships to understand their missions and goals and to determine how best we can collaborate, again, that collaboration thing, uh, together to uh, try to achieve them. And it's important for the county government to work internally and externally among our diverse communities to develop shared understandings of racial equity and social justice and to formulate clear and actionable goals for progress in these areas. Uh, you all have probably experienced, as I have for many years, that um, broad general terms like this often have many different understandings among many different people and having com conversations with communities to get to a common understanding of what we're trying to move toward um, and achieve is often very important so that we're not uh, uh, going back and forth with catchphrases and then uh, being upset with each other because we didn't have a common understanding of what we were trying to get to. Um, I will try to increase the diversity of input on, uh, on policies and programs by expanding stakeholder engagement with communities of color. 
Uh, we are already trying to do that uh, through some of our work on common ownership communities. And we're also, uh, well, I'll mention that in a second, the next thing. Um, I would also like to increase understanding of and dedication to addressing equity, not just as equal opportunity, to focus uh, actions on closing gaps and outcomes, and to devise approaches to proactively support households and communities. Uh, these efforts could include, uh, but are not limited to, reducing ho housing cost burdens for the most burdened households, as cost burdens uh, often fall most heavily on communities of color, supporting down payment assistance and home buying readiness uh, to try to, again, uh, the c communities of color are often more uh, affected than any others uh, in the ability to uh, save for a down payment and then yet get access to our mortgage. Tracking existing subsidized and naturally occurring or NOAA uh, affordable housing to inform strategic decisions about when and how to intervene to preserve affordability and protect low income communities from displacement. Also, and this is the one I was going to mention, uh, we're beginning to identify and work with historic African American communities in Montgomery County to prevent displacement and to preserve rental and ownership affordability. I know that there are a few that are very commonly known uh, in the county, but uh, there, I've been told there were some 40 uh, existing historically, and we're looking into ones, which ones still exist uh, and how could we could be of much uh, help. And Council, uh, Vice President, Council Vice President Friedson has approached us about one particular initiative that we're hoping to work with him on. Very good. Last question I have for you, uh, straightforward. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Um, I have one. I'll just restate it from before. Uh, I am on the I am on the uh, board of my own common ownership community. It's a condo association. I'm the vice president. Um, I uh, I guess I'm doing penance for something I did in a past life. Um, but it is you know it is a learning experience and it helped keep me closer to the work. Um, the um, uh, the chief counsel of the Ethics Commission said that it was okay to stay on as a board member. Uh, the only uh, uh, time I would have to recuse myself would be uh, for a matter that, uh, that the department is doing or the CCOC, the a Committee on Common Ownership Communities, uh, would be taking any action directly associated then I, with, my con with my condo and then I would recuse myself. Duly noted. Thank you for that. I'll turn it over to colleagues. And first is Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I got to ask the first question: Is who's the president of the co of the common ownership <laughs> community of the you know now about to be the director of the uh, the department that oversees it? Is the vice president? It uh, must be a very talented and credentialed uh, individual. I frequently joke at the common ownership uh, communities that I don't have the political skills or the stomach to serve on my common ownership community, so I just ran for county council instead. So <laughs> thank you for your service in that. It is not easy to serve on a common ownership uh, community board. These are very challenging positions that are volunteer positions, and so thanks to you. And I just want to broadly thank everybody in the county who serves uh, in these roles. We, we need them, and thank you for your work, because we do need some work on the common ownership communities and in working with some of the distressed communities in particular uh, to help to address what is some of our most important owner-occupied naturally occurring affordable housing, some of the older stock that actually provides entry points for first-time home buyers and for our aging adult population. So thank you for that. But I I'm, I'm really uh, appreciate uh, the county executive uh, moving your nomination forward. It has been really a pleasure to work so closely and collaboratively with you over the past several months, uh, we don't agree on everything, and that's okay. Uh, but we have uh, found a way, and you have demonstrated uh, your ability to work with me, to work with my office, to work with external stakeholders when they reach out to address issues as they arise, particularly with our nonprofit affordable housing providers who you know, have frequently reached out. They're some of our most important partners uh, in the county, and the relationship has not always been perfect. Uh, understandably, but uh, your your willingness and interest in moving that forward, um, and you know, I, I appreciate uh, all of the various uh, issues that you brought up. I'll note the nonprofit fund will be an important tool for preservation as well. You mentioned that earlier, but didn't mention necessarily in that um, uh, answer. And I really appreciate your work on that. Um, on the staffing, I just wanted to note for you, 
Um, I, and I want to note for college, I talked about it in committee at budget, but I really do think we should be looking at the DHCA staffing for um, enforcement related activities more in an enterprise level. Uh, like we do with permitting, it would make it much easier for us to you know, staff up as appropriate as the number of units go up uh, to make sure that we can actually enforce the, 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 the laws that we have, which we have not done nearly as good a job as we would want to ensure dignified and safe housing for all of our residents. I just want to note that for you directly related to the uh, to the point uh, that you uh, made. But uh, there are a number of issues that you talked about are things that either the committee collectively with Councilmember Jawando and, and Councilmember Reamer before it or, or me individually have been working on for years. I've been talking about hip transparency literally since the day I showed up uh, at this uh, council leading up to our first uh, budget, the nonprofit preservation fund, been working on for three years. The uh, ROFR issues and the uh, challenges with that process I've been talking about for three years. Uh, and I'm glad that we finally are able to work on those uh, issues together to, to make sure that we work them out in an appropriate way. We passed the pilot bill for nonprofit uh, communities, which has some administrative challenges in moving it forward, and we're working through those. Uh, as well, and just you know, really do appreciate uh, the fact that uh, we don't have to agree to work very collaboratively together. I think often it's led to better outcomes when uh, you've come into meetings and other stakeholders have come into meetings, maybe with a difference of opinion to start, and it's helped to you know sharpen the tool, so to speak, and get us to a better place. And uh, I personally very much look forward to you taking this official step, although you've been acting in this capacity for. Uh, quite some time and uh, look forward to continuing to work together to address our housing challenges and uh, appreciate that and we'll yield back to you Ms. President. Thank you. Thank you very much Vice President Reeves and uh, Council Member Sales. Thank you Mr. President and thank you Mr. Burton for uh, being here today. Um, I will echo the sentiments of my colleagues. I've enjoyed working with you and appreciate your willingness to listen and um, weigh in on some of the um, difficult decisions before the council. Um, as we all know, affordable housing is a major issue in our country um, and the need to preserve existing affordable housing um, is um, always a priority while also trying to balance that with expanding the current stock of affordable housing. Um, during the recent budget session, um, it was pretty clear um, that most residents are moving to nearby jurisdictions with lower costs. Um, and just, I know that you are aware of the two bills that are currently being um, debated on rent control. I wanted to know if you had um, any thoughts about things that we're not doing here in Montgomery County to energize, revitalize the affordable housing market? Um, and then wanted to ask, um, you know, part of what led to these rent control bills were reports of, you know, some really high rent increases across the county. And so, I don't know what DHCA has been doing or any plans that you have to do um, just to protect tenant rights um, uh, since we're debating these two bills and hopefully that will be a solution to um, that, uh, but anything that you can share that we can improve upon. Sure, thank you for the question, I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'll start first with what we have been doing. Um, especially regarding rent increases. Uh, the Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs, um, we do not under current law have the ability to uh, tell a landlord they can't increase rents uh, since you know you all passed uh, back during the pandemic a temporary uh, rent stabilization or protection uh, bill and there was uh, a bit of a gray area about enforcement but uh, Ulta did contact several landlords who uh, increased it above what was allowed under that temporary uh, law. When the law expired, Ulta moved to actively soliciting complaints from tenants about uh, what were considered egregious or, or gouging uh, rent increases. Um, and so we gathered, oh gosh, 
I think it was less than 150, but more than 100 um, complaints about significant increases in rent. And so we've passed those along. Uh, we've passed those along to OLO, uh, Office of Le uh, Legislative Oversight, for their rent stabilization uh, research report. Mm -hmm. um, and we passed that information along, I think, to the council and the county executive uh, because we've gotten multiple requests um, from you all about that. Um, we do our best under current law to inform tenants of their rights and responsibilities when they're when we're contacted. Um, unfortunately, we could tell them we tell them we can only do so much. Um, regarding what could be done and what we what should try to do, uh, I think. It's laudatory that almost that pretty much everybody on the council is in favor of some sort of rent regulation bill, I and I know that everyone is working very hard uh, to create um, uh, a, a consensus bill uh, that can pass that will deal uh, with these issues. Um, I sent around to all of you uh, some comments, uh, some, some suggestions. Uh, for the debate about uh, changes that might be made to merge parts of the bills or bring in some, you know, things from outside. Um, and I'm confident that uh, whatever comes out of your deliberations will be a great improvement over what the current situation is. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that because you have a whole lot of red language uh, from me on that one to read through. Um, just cause eviction, which I know for everybody out there in TV land, uh, it's not something that the council can deal with. Uh, it has to be passed by the state, but I know there are some changes uh, in who controls certain committees and things like that, and so there might be the chance, and so anything that the county government can do to advocate for enabling legislation for just cause eviction at the state level would be of great benefit uh, to tenants here. Um, and I can say as far as things we're trying to do to with Ulta, uh, we're revising the Landlord-Tenant Handbook, putting in much more detail. Um, we, are, we have, uh, what do you call it, contracts with five community-based organizations that provide tenant technical assistance. And we are revising those contracts this year to change some of the responsibilities and deliverables uh, to try to use lessons learned, both from what's happened here and things that I bring from what I learned in, in the District of Columbia uh, to improve our outreach on things such as eviction, um, how to prevent eviction, uh, how to deal with landlord-tenant issues. Um, and we're, I'm, I've increased my own involvement in some of the landlord-tenant disputes that are between tenant associations um, and landlords to try to find uh, amicable solutions. Um, and we're encouraging uh, further the formation of tenant associations uh, where tenants are interested in doing that, uh, you know, completely aside from right of first refusal issues as a way for tenants to kind of speak collectively um, and to be better heard. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Um. Thank you so much, and I will say you kind of answered my question by the last point, but I wasn't quick enough to withdraw, and I will just say um, thank you um, so much to you and um, your department, especially um, the Office of Landlord-Tenant Affairs, I mean, all of DHCA, but the Office of Landlord-Tenant Affairs um, has done such amazing work. Um, you know, as a district council person who has the most renters uh, in the district, uh, we've gotten to know the folks um, in that office really well. And I'm glad, very glad to hear that the um, handbook would be updated and your emphasis on collaboration. Because one of the things that uh, we hear a lot from um, residents is that they don't know about the resources um, that are available um, to them. And so I'm glad to hear that you're putting an emphasis on that area and also helping people um, to create tenant associations. Um, so I'll just say thank you. Um, but that was going to be uh, my question was in that area, and you've answered it already. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very good, council member. Uh, and it is uh, a testament to uh, Mr. Bruton's um, engagement in the moment uh, here at the council and in Rockville. Uh, as has been noted, there are uh, a number of bills that are currently before us as we work to ensure that residents can continue affording to live in Montgomery County. 
Um, and as noted, there are other initiatives of which we are all uh, supportive of to expand affordable housing and be creative in the ways that we do so. So there is a lot uh, on your plate um, in addition to serving on your HOA. Um, which, depending on the day, might be the, uh, the largest workload you carry. Um, but uh, we uh, appreciate this conversation. Um, and as you noted, um, it's all about conversations um, and trying to figure out how we can all move together to get to where we need to be and where our residents want us as well. Um, and so uh, thank you for this conversation. Colleagues, thank you for your questions. Mr. Bruton will be um, uh, approving this nomination next week. Um, and in the meantime, um, uh, you're still acting director, so you still have work to do. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for today's conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it, y'all. Thank you. Um, and colleagues, with that, we are adjourned.